<clears throat> Good evening, my dear colleagues. Welcome to another Inget Zoom series. Today, our guest is Associate Professor Dr. Elif Tokdemir uh, Demiran, who is an Associate Professor and the Chair of the English Translation and Inter Interpretation Department at Kırıkkale University. Elif Ojam is also a board member of the European Writing Centers Association. Her research interests are second language writing, corpus linguistics and learner corpora studies, mobile learning, and teaching technologies in ELT and classroom interaction. This evening, the title of her talk is The Intersection of Corpora and Language Teaching, Practical Tips and suggestions. Elif Ocam, thank you very much for being with us this evening as our guest speaker and welcome again. The screen is all yours. Thank you very much Aydan Ocam. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation and I would also like to thank my colleagues uh, and my teachers uh, for being here to listen to this presentation. Now I'm sharing my screen and I will start the presentation in a minute. Uh, okay. So I want to turn on full screen. Uh, so can you see the first title page? Uh, I guess so, right? Okay. So I don't know, John kindly introduced me. So I'm not going to do any introductions, but I would like to say good evening to everybody again. Uh, so first of all, I would like to start with uh, a memory. Uh, I will show you a name tag on the screen. So this name tag is uh, dated 1997. Uh, and it was one of the first conferences of INGET. And I was very lucky to attend it. it was, I was at the beginning of my career then. And I also wouldn't like to start without saying that INGET has a very special place in my career uh, following the conferences, meeting their people, colleagues, and hearing about new advances in language teaching has always uh, shed light in my path, in my career. So I've, when I found this in my office, I keep all of the name tags. Uh, I, you know, I traveled back in history <laughs> And uh, I wanted to share this memory with you. So I'm very happy that INGET is continuing these activities and is also following the technology. And now that we are here online, although we cannot meet in person as frequently as we wish. So, uh, okay, now, as you can see, the title of my presentation is Intersectional Corpora and Language Teaching, Practical Tips and Suggestions. Um, I'm going to present a mix of both theoretical and practical uh, sides of corpus linguistics. Um, the first time I heard about corpus linguistics was in 2001. Uh, when I went to for a postdoctoral, uh, not postdoctoral, but when I was doing my uh, doctoral studies, I had the opportunity to go to United States with a Fulbright scholarship. I had the chance of meeting Douglas Biber there, and I heard about corpus for the first time from them, and all of the doctoral students were saying, I want to study corpus and this subject and that subject, and I said, what is corpus? What is this? I had no idea. But uh, I'm very happy to have learned about this subject and from those people. Um, and I had like uh, friends uh, like Shelly, for example, Shelly Staples. I'm going to refer, make a reference to her today. They are still continuing to do research. I also did some research, but mine is mostly at the intersection of language teaching and corpora, like writing, for example, speaking and so on. So uh, without further ado, I want to continue with my presentation. So I know that most of you know what corpus is. You are not as ignorant as I was at back in 2001, but uh, maybe there are people who are not familiar. So I want to start with these questions. What is it? Why do we use it? And how should we use it? So this is going to be the outline of the presentation. Uh, 
So uh, first of all, I would like to show you a picture. So what can you, what is this in the picture? So this is a, a box of something we like to buy very much, <laughs> like shoes, <laughs> a shoe box, right? So what does it have to do with linguistics? Let me talk about that. So imagine that you are a linguist and you are asked to de describe the English language, but you have uh, like no computers, no grammar books, uh, no dictionaries of English. You have just two boxes. So how do you go about exploring the language? So I would like to uh, tell you about an experience from Otto Jesperson. Danish professor Otto Jesperson was faced with this dilemma. Excuse uh, me, Elifoja, I'm just going to need to interrupt. I'm sorry. Uh, the slides are not changing. Not changing. Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, so maybe sorry. you should uh, uh, share full screen. Uh, OK, I will stop and start one more time. So uh, OK, let me see uh, here. Um, right. So now, what can you see the, uh, the slide with? Uh -huh. The question marks? No, right uh, I can only see the first uh, slide, the, the uh, title slide. Uh, can you can you just uh, turn uh, screen share off? Okay. I will try one other thing. Uh, can you please start uh, sharing your screen? But this time, is uh, okay. Let let me let's check the second slide. Can you please move on? Yes. How about now? Excellent. Now Excellent. there are some question marks and questions. Okay, so we are moving now. So you couldn't see the shoebox, I guess. Now can you see it, right? Yes. So, uh, so as I said before, if you have no computers, no grammar books because they were being written for the first time back then, no dictionaries, and you have just shoeboxes to store information then what you can do is what Otto Jesperson just did. Uh, he set out to write his monumental work, A Modern English Grammar on Historical Principles. It's one of the first uh, grammar, uh, let's say, very advanced grammar books. Uh, in his autobiography, he describes his experience of how his large villa uh, outside of Copenhagen gradually filled with shoeboxes containing uh, thousands of paper slips on which he noted examples of interesting English sentences from his copious reading of English literature. Then he used uh, all of these interesting sentences in his grammar book, in sections of his grammar book, and uh, he picked all of these from these shoeboxes. Uh, so uh, they mm, they had to do that back then. But later on, what happened is we moved from the shoebox to the computer. I don't want to call him a dinosaur, of course, but just that's uh, just uh, I liked the pretty pictures, so I wanted to use that. So we moved on to computers in storing data and analyzing data, and that uh, opened us new horizons, uh, and that brought us to computer. Uh, and corpus linguistics, let's say. And so what is the definition of a corpus? It's defined by Biber et al. as a collection of spoken and written texts organized by register and coded for other discourse considerations. So it's not a haphazard uh, collection of texts. It has some purpose. Uh, it is organized according according to a principle, sometimes according to a research question. And Kennedy, also uh, one of the pioneers of corpus linguistics, defines corpus as a collection of texts. They can be electronic or not. The first ones, the shoeboxes, were also a kind of corpus, we can say. Uh, they might be, uh, today, all of the corpora are machine readable. It's the norm today. They can be whole or partial. They can be compiled for various purposes, including, including linguistic research, 
and they represent a particular text sample. It can be written, oral, a historical period, and so on. And they are usually designed to answer questions at various linguistics levels, prosody, grammar, discourse, pragmatics, and so on. Right, so uh, the corpora which have existed from the beginning of corpus research have been divided into some eras. The early corpora are what we call the, the early corpora were developed in the 1960s and 70s. And they were like around 1 million words, maybe 5,000 words and so on. The Brown corpus is one of the first examples. The Lancaster Oslo Bergen corpus, for example, London Lund corpus, these are the early corpora. Later on, the number started to increase. The number of corpora started to increase in the early 80s and early 90s. We can see Bank of English, for example, the BNC, which still continues to uh, contribute a lot to the area. ICE corpora, for example, uh, Wellington corpus, which represents New Zealand variety of English and so on, Helsinki corpus, Archer corpus, and so on. Uh, so for example, Archer corpus is mostly like historical 50 year periods of British and American English. And, and until uh, after nine, we can see, uh, as you can see on the screen, other kinds of corpora. And these are uh, not the only examples. Uh, new ones are being added continuously. So I'm not going to read all of them one by one. Uh, so today, one of the resources I use very frequently is the BNC corpus. Uh, first, it was just this page was called the BNC corpus, was, but today it is like an, you know, um, a site which collects all of the uh, contemporary corpora under one roof. So it's englishcorpora.org. It's a very valuable resource. Uh, I was using lots of, here you can see very interesting corpora, for example, the coronavirus corpus, right? Uh, you can find lots of different kinds of corpora. The most uh, widely used ones were the BNC and the COCA, BNC being British corpus and the COCA American. But there are many, many different corpora which can be used uh, freely, free of charge. You just have to sign up and create an account. Uh, and if you want, you can donate sometimes, but it's not, of course, uh, forced. You can sometimes, uh, I have contributed a couple of times, but they don't uh, require that. So it's free, mostly it's free to use and your students can also log in and use them. And for example, here you can see other ones uh, like magazines, newspapers, uh, television series, all kinds of uh, language from all of these sources have been compiled for use. And it also has a very user friendly interface. Uh, so um, all of these language data are here for us to use. So what is the Characteristics of corpus-based analysis. So what are we going to do with all this data? Uh, and what is the advantage of using a corpus-based analysis approach? Uh, it's empirical, first of all. And it uh, analyzes actual patterns of use in natural texts. It's not made up, made up. The examples are not fabricate. They are naturally occurring and they have been compiled from real data. I think very important. And you can use a large and principled collection of natural texts. And uh, also corpus-based analysis uses extensively computers. And it depends on both quantitative and qualitative analytic techniques. It's not just counting. Uh, you also try to answer meaningful research questions using qualitative approaches. And here uh, you can see I have a problem here. Something is blocking my uh, view. So, okay, now it's good. Linguist uh, Lindquist defines a concordance as a list of all the contexts in which a word occurs in a particular text. So 
here in the picture, you can see a concordance. This is keyword in context. We call this keyword in context. For example, this corpus is my own corpus of social sciences research papers written by native speakers. You can see it here, maybe all of the uh, file names are here. Social science, native speaker, 001 TXT. So all these text files. So basically, it is compiled, cleaned up text files, and then load onto a concordancer and use. So here, what I did was I searched for the word because in its context. Uh, and what comes, I can see it in a line, a limited line, but if I click on it, I can see a wider context. So it allows me to see a word which I'm interested in, in its context. Uh, so this is called the concordance line. Uh, and here you can see it bigger, right? For example, uh, you can see the keyword and then what follows it, uh, color coded and for different purposes, of course. What can we get out of corpora? Uh, Corpus-based analysis are not only simple counts of linguistic features, uh, it allows us to analyze I was expecting something like this because uh, she, her vision was frozen several times. And guys, honestly, I have nothing to say about corpora. <laughs> so let's hope that let's keep our fingers crossed that Elifoja will come back soon. Yes, I believe she's back. Yes, hooray. Okay. <laughs> you scared me, Elifoja. You scared me. I think I'm back, right? Yes, okay. you're back. Right. Welcome back. So, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, right. So can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay, right. So I was, uh, last thing I said, well, last thing you heard, what did you hear last? I don't know, but I was talking about uh, what we can get out of corpora. And I was saying we can analyze complex association patterns between lexical and grammatical uh, units of linguistics. And we can look at distributions across registers, dialects, time periods, distributions of linguistic items, lexical items uh, across registers, dialects, and so on. So this is, I think, uh, very valuable information to be able to find in a short time. Although compiling the corpus is not, does, takes a long time, but after you compile a really, you know, structured corpora, then there are thousands of things you can do with it. Uh, and also we can develop reference works such as dictionaries using a corpus. For example, the Cobalt Dictionary has been uh, uh, developed using a corpus approach. We can develop language teaching materials. We can explore spoken and written genres of language. We can research language acquisition. And we can also carry out contrastive cross-linguistic analysis for translation studies. Um, for example, I have compiled my students' uh, language production a lot, for example, spoken uh, language production, written language production. And it gave me a very important insight about what are their needs, what do they need, what are their problematic areas. What are their strengths? So it's also a good way of doing kind of classroom analysis, uh, or let's say needs analysis or action research. Um, and also, what are the advantages of a corpus-based approach? According to Startwick, uh, corpus data is more objective. It can easily be very, uh, it's needed for studies of variations between users and styles. It provides frequency of occurrence of linguistic items. It provides illustrative examples, which we can use, for example. And also we can get, uh, sorry, I am getting uh, sometimes a warning about my internet, um, but I think you can hear me now, right? No problem. Okay, good. It gives us 
essential information for a number of applied areas, language teaching, machine translation, speech synthesis. Right. So other advantages are uh, accessing uh, the computerized corpora is very easy. Usually researchers provide access to corpora and you can reach all kinds of data. They are shared. And also they are ideal for non-native speakers of the language to explore real language data. Also, there are disadvantages. I didn't write them here, but some, some researchers think that um, using corpus data is um, easier for advanced level students and for beginner level students, it's kind of hard to uh, use the data. But here the teachers have a role. Teachers have to do the research first before presenting the data to the students, the teachers can work on it. And I'm going to try and show how we can make uh, corpus resources available, uh, more accessible to our students. And I will try to give an example from one of my own uh, studies. Okay, so how can we use a corpus-based approach in language teaching? Uh, so, the focus of corpus linguistics is uh, uh, on language in use, according to Bird, uh, and this has led to the development of new tools and information to grammar instruction. Uh, I um, want to talk about this uh, theoretical, one last theoretical thing, but I think it's important, so I don't want to uh, go on without mentioning this. The materials developed through corpus research is made based on the distribution of resources of English among different discourse types. So uh, this is a change of perspective from syntactic sentence level analysis to grammar arising from context. So this, uh, in a way, presents a different approach to our teaching. Uh, and the multidimensional approach introduced by Biber also um, studies underlying grammatical patterns that characterize different types of discourse. So in different types of discourse, we are using different lexical grammatical patterns, but we are teaching our students the same things to do all kinds of different things. So here, this approach maybe will change our perspective to teaching. Uh, in the next slide, it will be more clear. Uh, I want to give an example from the multidimensional approach. For example, underlying grammatical patterns that characterize different types of discourse. Uh, when we talk about this, uh, Biber has uh, defined involved communication. So what is involved communication? In the multidimensional analysis, you come up with different factor loadings and all of these factor loadings give you a dimension. One dimension is features of conversational interactions. And uh, Biber has called this involved communication. And lexical grammatical features needed to participate in English are included in involved communication. So when you look at the clustering of lexical grammatical features in involved communication, you can see the tools that can be used for everyday communication, right? And some things are not there. Some things we teach are not uh, in that list, but we still teach them, right? So that's what I mean. So the, this quote is very important. This is in Hinkle's, uh, you know, edited book by Bird. To learn to have a conversation is, in English is not to learn first about tenses, then about nouns, then about questions as separate entities and vaguely related to each other. In conversation, these are strongly related to each other. So uh, I think this uh, represents a change of perspective, which we can reach through a corpus approach. So if you can look at here, can you see this? Uh, this is kind of maybe small, but on top you can see involved written, right? At the bottom, you can see informational. So involved is speaking, like conversation. English. Informational is mostly written English. So here you can see the linguistic features, the positive features in involved, com involved conversation are these, and the negative features are these. For example, in uh, uh, here, 
In involved communication, which tense is used? Let's have a look at it. Present tense, right? And are there other tenses? Not really, right? Mostly present tense is used, okay? Second person pronoun, do as a proverb, that deletion, right? Contractions, shortenings, and stuff like that. But we start teaching students, before you learn all the tenses, you cannot speak, right? You have to learn past perfect continuous before you speak. So I don't know, do they need that? Uh, maybe if they can start with the present tense and start using it, get some confidence, then of course, when they move to the bottom, to the informational English, of course, they need it to read complex texts, but to speak, to have face-to-face -face conversations, to have telephone conversations, what they need is these features. So um, the connection is here, I think. The important connection between corpus research and uh, teaching lies in multidimensional analysis, which defines lexicogrammatical features, which define different kinds of language use. So this is what I like about this approach, actually. And maybe if we can translate this into our teaching, uh, we will have more students more confidently speaking in the future. Uh, so of course, this is not a very new research and it has been applied. So I made a chart here um, about incorporating corpora into language teaching, different ways of using it. So you don't have to be a corpus uh, expert to use corpus linguistics in your teaching. Uh, so in corpora in ELT, you can use available resources, first of all. What are those available resources? Uh, publicly available corpora. You can make use of those resources, for example. And you can use materials developed through a corpus-based approach if you are interested in presenting your students with naturally occurring uh, language and the change in language, of course. And if you want to use a customized approach, uh, you can use, you can build your own corpora. You can build your own corpora from existing texts, or you can compile your students' productions. For example, what I did was I recorded my students' uh, speaking lessons, sometimes speaking exams. I transcribed them. I put them on computer. And then it a lot of ideas about how they are using the language in, spoke, in spoken form. Then uh, after you build your own corpora, you can use concordancing programs for data mining and analyzing that data and maybe building your own resources, asking questions and finding answers to those questions. And you can use a data-driven learning approach. Uh, this is mostly building your own customized materials with a specialized corpus. And you can also use learner corpora, spoken or written. Uh, so these are all kinds of different ways you can use corpora in language teaching. And I want to, from this point, I want to show you some practical uh, aspects. Uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with these. Uh, so for example, uh, using publicly available corpora, I want to show you an example from the um, first site that I showed you with compiled all kinds of corpora. For example, the TV corpus is one of the corpora available there. And actually, this is also something new for me because uh, earlier there was only context. So they have added new features, translate, Google, image, uh, video and book. So I want to show you um, the word friend, for example. I searched for the word friend in the TV corpus, and I came up with 128,560 occurrences of friend. So imagine that your uh, students want to find out about this word more, how it's used, what is used with it. Uh, what can they do, for example? They can go to the corpus and first find its frequency, and then they can look at the concordance lines, for example. This is the keyword in context line. So friend, the sentences friend is used 
in Alfred Hitchcock's something here. It comes from, I think, a documentary or something. Uh, so dear friend, I know my friend. So you can look at these, explore them. What else can you do? For example, you can look at the collocations of a friend, a friend, my friend, your friend, best friend, old friend. So this is not very difficult for your students, right? Up to here, they can do this on their own and they can explore a newly learned word. They can look at what it occurs most frequently with. So would they help them? I think so. It would help them to see when, for example, they are writing, they don't know how to put in front of a word as an adjective. You can also search for those words, like you can search for the word just before, coming before friend, which is an adjective, right? You can also put part of speech. That's uh, also possible. And also the new features, for example, if you click on Google here, it takes you directly to Google and Googles the word friend and gives you the uh, Google search for friend. So uh, I'm looking from the perspective of students, they can uh, using the corpus without going back into internet, they can search for the content of the word. They can click on uh, the image, for example, again, on the corporate, it gives you all the images about friend. Uh, and you can also look at video, then it gives you a TED talk in which a friend word is uh, used. So you can listen to the pronunciation of the word and hear it in context, for example. And books, you can search for books which have the keyword friend in them. So these are new features. But uh, you can search for collocations, you can search for like uh, engrams or clusters with friend in it, if that's the word you are searching for. So these are uh, uh, activities which give you the context of the word, right? This is mostly about lexical work, but I think uh, these are going to be useful and enjoyable maybe for students if you want to use available corpora. And you can use language teaching materials uh, also developed through a you know, um, corpus approach. I don't know, Jam, I don't know if this is going to be advertisement, but uh, uh, if you don't want, I, I may not show the <laughs> titles, but yeah, I just wanted to uh, give an idea that there are out there some books which are developed through the corpus approach. Uh, for example, uh, this one, the third, but by McCarty, uh, it uses Cambridge International Corpus of North American English. Uh, so the resource it uses is 700 million words of written and spoken English. And Colin Scobield English course, for example, uses the Colin Scobield uh, corpora corpus also. Uh, and it uh, contains the 700 most frequent word in English and they account for 70% of all English text, and it makes use of that information, for example. And Natural Grammar by Thornby, again, based on corpus research. Other ones, uh, Randy Rappon's book, Grammar and Beyond, is also one of the examples of grammar books developed through a corpus approach. And Phrasal Verbs, American English, for example, Corpus Lab book, Business, phrasal verbs. Uh, these are some examples of books which have been developed through a corpus approach. Uh, these are different from maybe earlier books because the examples in them come from real data. So they may be more close, closer to natural language use. Um, okay, and then uh, you can build your own corpora and use a concordancer, as I said before. And a, a concordancer, an example of a free concordancer is Antconc. Uh, there are others, of course, but I use this one mostly, so I wanted to introduce it to you. So this is empty. As you can see here, there is no data in it. The data you have to put in the data yourself. Uh, you have to build your own corpus and put, but sometimes you can also download available corpora from the internet. That's also um, something you can do. 
So it looks something like this, the interface. Uh, what can you do with it? Very basic things I want to talk about. Uh, you can download it freely from the internet, depending on the operating system you, can, you use. You can choose Windows, Macintosh, Linux, and other stuff. It's totally free. And I want to thank Lawrence Anthony for making uh, such a valuable resource freely available here. Uh, okay, right. So here the screen looks like this. And on the left-hand side, uh, when you load your files, your files will appear. Your text, they have to be text files, very basic text files. And I don't know what here, this is the file window progress report window and search options. It's not very clear, but sort levels and concordance lines uh, and stuff like that. So here you can see, for example, the word list feature. On the left-hand side, you can see all of the files loaded here. There are 48 files, and these are academic texts, uh, published research articles. Um, and when you use the word list function, uh, it searches for all of the words. For example, the is the most frequent word here, uh, understandably. The function words come first, and when you scroll down, you are going to see more content words. And the next thing you can do is you can find, for example, uh, in this corpus, what are the most frequent groups of words, like and what we call n-grams, uh, clusters of words, for example. Uh, you can do that by running n search. Here you can see a box that you can click, and you can define the uh, the, for example, number of words, for example, a minimum four words. So I wanted to see uh, clusters of words, uh, like four word clusters here. So you can see, for example, this was about social sciences. So you can see some words, some clusters about teaching, kindergarten and first grade, for example, the degree to which. Prejudiced attitudes of teachers is one of the most frequent <laughs> clusters. I don't know why, but um, yeah, a black college presidents. This is from American context. So black college presidents has come up. Uh, so it gives you an idea about what is happening in these texts. What is the subject? What is the theme? And so on. Uh, you can also find collocates of words. For example, here I found collocate so the words because in this academic texts uh, dropped, for example, probably a student dropped out of school and the research was examining the reasons for that um, because retirement problematic omitted occur primarily uh, all of the words that can appear with because frequently the collocates are here. And you can also find keywords of a text. In order to find the keywords in a corpus, you have to have a reference corpus. Uh, there's a function here where you can upload a reference corpus in the background, and it searches these words uh, against that reference corpus. And for example, these were about social sciences and mostly about education. These 50 were about mostly education. There are um, a lot of files here, like I just picked out a portion of the corpus. So this was the portion about education. So as you can see, uh, the keywords are student, school, teacher, math, college, mathematics, learning, education. So it tells me that these words, these uh, texts are about this subject, right? So it comes up the, with the keywords. Um, so this may not be very, sound very important here, but I'm also teaching a medical translation course uh, in my department. And uh, there this becomes more important because before a student translates the text, they, want to, they have to find the keyword list. And I taught them this method. Now they can find the keywords at a glance. 
Before that, they were reading the 15-page paper and marking the keywords with their hands. Now they can just do it in seconds uh, after they learn this method. So, uh, so what we follow in translation is first they explore, analyze the text. They look at the important keywords. They find the keywords uh, in Turkish in the target language. Uh, and this helps them a lot for analyzing a text. It also is useful for translation. Okay, right. And the data-driven approach. This is not a very new approach. It was developed in 1991 by Johns. Um, the data-driven learning approach, uh, in a way, uh, advocates teachers using corpus resources and turning them into, uh, you know, customized uh, materials for their own students. So it has four steps, look, familiarize, practice, and create. At the look step, uh, you look at concordances for the key term and words surrounding it, thinking of meaning. In the familiarize step, you familiarize yourself with the patterns of language surrounding the key term by referring to the concordances as you complete the tasks. Practice uh, at this level, you practice key terms without referring to the concordance. And at the create level, you create your own production. It can be writing, it can be speaking, uh, using the terms you studied uh, to fulfill a particular function in academic writing or in speaking. So these are the steps. And also, uh, Thurston and Kendlin propose the steps for using concordancing in the teaching of, for example, academic vocabulary, but it can be applied to other uh, fields as well. Uh, first, for example, you can present students with multiple examples of the vocabulary items in context. Then uh, you have your students examine one line concordancing, concordancer, highlighting the word groups surrounding the keyword to discover how they are used and then answer questions on their using context. And the presentational concordances can be followed by exercises, enabling students to ensure that they are using the item appropriately. Uh, and then creative and improvisational activities follow. So it, it starts with analyzing, doing exercises, and then becoming creative. So it moves uh, from being more mechanical to being more creative. These are the suggested chain of tasks or activities in using a data-driven approach. I wanted to give you an example of how I used it for my students, this data-driven approach. And this is going to be the, I think the last part of my presentation. Uh, so I already talked about this looking right at concordancer. This is the example of the looking phase. You look at the keyword in context. For example, here you can see identification, identified, identify different lemmas of the same word. Uh, so you can see how it's used. This is the example from Jones. I'm going to show you my own example after this one. And the, at the familiarizing step, what you can do, uh, you can ask students questions. For example, which of the following statements do you think are true? Seek your answers. To identify involves naming. Is it true or false? To identify involves describing, imagining, deciding. They can refer back to the corpus when they are answering these questions. So these questions make them think about the words. And they can practice the key terms uh, after this uh, step, for example. Uh, they can do some exercises, for example. What can be identified? For example, facts can be identified. While they are uh, filling the blanks here, they can look at the corpus again and try to find uh, the words which can precede identify, which can be used with identify. So, um, for example, in the second one, uh, you can, the students are asked to look at the concordancer 
concordances in group two, which do not use part of the auxiliary to be, and circle the objects identified. What are the objects that are identified, for example? And later, they, you can ask your students to create uh, something, create a writing, create a production uh, with the words they have studied. For example, here there's a passage and uh, the students are asked to summarize them uh, here using the words they just learned. For example, the word identify, maybe they can relate to it. And, uh, summarize them using the words they have just learned. Okay, so what I did with this approach was I wanted to familiarize students with the academic word list uh, by Cox Head, and uh, I wanted them to use this approach and learn academic words because this was in the context of an academic writing class. Uh, I gave students uh, the 10 sublists of the academic word list, and I uh, divided them into groups of uh, three or four students, and I shared the concordance search task. Uh, they shared the task uh, with their groups, and I gave each group as one sublist to study. Uh, their task was to use the BNC, British National Corpus Interface, and to do concordance line and collocation searches for each target word on their sublist of the academic word list. After they completed this task, they filled in the information they gathered on a worksheet. I provided them with a worksheet. So I sent my students out uh, to the corpus. I first trained them in how to use it, of course. Then I gave them a task, a specific task to explore words. Uh, so this is the sub list of the academic word list here. You can see it on the screen. Uh, for example, the, uh, there are 60 families in each sub list. And uh, here you can see analyze, for example, then the different forms of this word and so on. This is the first sub list. And what they did was uh, they looked at the words their frequency. Uh, here I give some information about the academic word list by Coxhead. Uh, you must be familiar with it, but maybe I can just uh, talk about it. The word list is divided into sublists based on the frequency of occurrence of the words. And uh, sorry, uh, the words in sublist one, for example, are more frequent, and sublist two. Uh, are you know with, uh, which follows uh, has words with next highest frequency so it uh, the frequency level decreases from the first to the last uh, of them but they are all chosen from academic register and they are used in academic writing for that reason i wanted my students to get familiarized with these words and uh, the rationale for me to use the BNC was to focus on de in detail on a restricted set of vocabulary items and uh, to use concordancing to provide students with intensive exposure to the use of these items so that they would see uh, lots of examples with these sentences, they would become familiarized. So it was a lot of input, right? I provided uh, them through the corpora with input uh, of these a uh, restricted set of vocabulary. And uh, later on, I wanted uh, to use John's approach to familiarize my students with Coxhead's academic word list. So what they came up with, I'm going to skip this here. This was the uh, chart I wanted them to fill. Uh, so, for example, uh, they were searching for the word individual, let's say. Uh, first, they wanted, they found the definitions of the word. They put them here. Then they found the collocations of the word on the left, on the right. For example, an individual, every individual, particular individual. These are the words which come before individual and which words come after individual. So this was... Uh, 
completed by the students in the groups. So they worked uh, for, this was kind of a long project, like a term project. So uh, they spent a lot of effort and they found example sentences from the corpus and they wrote them here. So this was kind of the familiarizing, looking and familiarizing steps. Uh, then they, I, the second task after doing this was to create activities for practicing the vocabulary items for their peers and themselves. So the students first familiarize themselves with the vocabulary. Then I asked them to create exercises. Uh, I didn't create the exercises, the students did, uh, but depending on the maturity level, for example, these were university students, uh, they were able to do it, but with uh, younger students, maybe uh, this could be hard for them to do. Uh, for example, they created these kinds of exercises with uh, sentences from the corpus and then uh, filling in the blanks with the correct word. This was one of the, uh, you know, simple uh, vocabulary exercises they created. And then in the create phase, the students created their written reports for academic writing uh, assignments, and they had collaboratively created a resource to use, which reflects authentic language from the BNC corpus. So we compiled all of this information together as a reference book for vocabulary used in academic writing. So we put together all of the group's productions uh, to provide a reference work that was our creating phase and they shared it with their friends so this was the production so in a way at the beginning i uh, had two pictures now i put them together uh, so what i want to give the message i want to give is uh, we have to think outside the box and uh, we have to know that we can always create our own authentic materials using corpora. We can build our own corpora. We are not restricted to what is presented to us through, um, you know, course books. But of course, there are lots of materials out there, and we can use them for our, our own purposes in a productive way. Uh, I hope uh, this is going to be helpful for you for your teaching practices. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your patience and thank you for your participation. If you have questions, uh, you are free to ask. Mm -hmm. Jump, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. And I believe your thank last you. slide is uh, like think outside the shoebox. <laughs> Refer <laughs> yes. Referring to your first slide. No, the shoe boxes are always <laughs> going to be there. We love yeah. shoes. So. Of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, in uh, well, of course, the shoe box has gained a negative meaning recently. But still, we will use them. I believe for shoes, maybe not for anything yeah. else. Uh, if for jump, uh, I don't have a question, but I just want to. Um, uh, say something, make a comment, and then share a, a, a kind of an anecdote uh, with all the um, um, audience here. Uh, corpus studies or corpora, uh, these are vital for language teachers. I mean, of course, they are very useful for learners, but I believe it's a must for language teachers. Why do I say that? Um, those who know me uh, know that I uh, am into teaching English to young learners. And uh, when you deal with young learners, of course, you use storytelling mm -hmm. and dramatization technique. And when I was teaching uh, at Gazi University, I assigned uh, different stories uh, to groups and they were to prepare storytelling uh, techniques and then uh, dramatize it. One of my students uh, started telling a story about a chicken family. Uh, the uh, father chicken, rooster, mother chicken and baby chicks. Of course, this poor girl 
uh, started using another word, the C word. Uh, with this, you know, with young learners, supposedly these are young learners, right, sitting in front of you. So she started the story about this rooster, I'm going to say rooster, but she said the other word. Uh, the rooster did this, rooster did that, and I just kept doing this, you know, trying to send signals, don't, don't, you know, don't keep saying that word. But but she she was just so sure of herself and uh, after a while I said uh, stop stop I cannot take this anymore you're dealing with little children in front of you and you're teaching a taboo word are you aware of that she goes like what taboo word I said why don't you say rooster why do you say the other word she said well I checked the dictionary and it meant a male chicken. I said, did you check the other meanings? <laughs> How frequently it is used for something else? She goes like, ah, now I understand why when I Googled it to find a picture, I found very strange pictures. I said, congratulations, bravo. <laughs> so guys, as language teachers, of course we're gonna teach language, but we need to teach clean language. Semantic deterioration is a process. Some words gain a different meaning in time, please. Please check the word and not only look at the first meaning of it, but all, please. And as Ilifojama has suggested, maybe you also want to check it in context. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I know. It, it, I mean, that poor girl, she was so ashamed. Okay. Well, I have another um, anecdote related to cat in the boots. The old version, puss in the boot. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to tell it. You can easily imagine. I mean, the title is very clean. But then if you start calling the cat with the cute version, then it gains another meaning. You know, when you add a certain letter at the end, I'm not going to say the word. Uh, so uh, that was another story. <laughs> I won't tell it, but please uh, adopt this corpus, okay, corpora. Check whatever you want to teach. Even if you're 100% sure that a word means this, check it. As Elifojam has said, it only takes seconds, thanks to this technology, uh, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. I can read the remarks in the chat box. Yeah. Um, Elifojam, what do you think of uh, the age group? In your presentation, you mentioned that using this with young learners can be a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. So are you suggesting that this is more like for older learners? Not really. Um, what I'm suggesting is, of course, young learners cannot be able to use the BNC, the COCA, mm -hmm. the TV corpus. That would sound, be very advanced for them. What you can do is you can create for them a storybook uh, corpus, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. with very simple story words like um, fables, for example. Mm -hmm. You can put together a simple fable uh, corpus, and then you can they can very easily use them today's children are very computer literate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you can ask them uh, for example when uh, a cat right a cat uh, 
how can we uh, what comes before a cat what adjectives are used to describe a cat mm. find it black cat for example right what are the different names given to a cat so you can just ask them to do searches simple searches in a corpus which is there for their age so the, the data-driven approach is important for this reason. You can create your own materials for uh, all kinds of different learners at different levels. Uh, but university students, for example, my students uh, were able to use the BNC to correct their uh, mistakes in writing. Right? Yeah. I uh, checked their writing, for example, in one of my it was kind of a very action research study. Uh, I marked their uh, problems in their writing with, you know, for example, wrong word, WW and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I asked them to go on the corpus, look at there and try to find the correct word that you have to use. For example, which adverb had to go here instead mm -hmm. of the one you used. So they were able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are lots of things you can do with university students. Uh, for young learners, you have to get creative and create your own resources. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if the teacher, uh, if um, as a teacher, I'm working with a group of young learners, I can uh, form my own data mm -hmm. and students can work with that. Or you can uh, put together your corpus, uh -huh. you can create materials for your students, you can okay. create exercises uh, from, for example, fairy tales uh -huh. uh, or well, stuff like that, something which would interest them. I encounter, as you know, children's stories um, are full of mm -hmm. strange language examples. Mm -hmm. So a chair can dance, for example, in a story, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or um, I don't know, a flower can sing in a story. Mm -hmm. uh, in normal life, they don't. But you know, children, uh, they have a, a great imagination, and they 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 can deal with these. Um, will that be a problem? Mm -hmm. I didn't think, think about that, but I think they know that that's a story. The context mm -hmm. is important. That's mm -hmm. a story. That's a fairy tale. It's not real life. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, maybe you can caution them, mm -hmm. but I don't think that could be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because their imagination, uh, I think we should teach them something strange, something interesting yeah. that's going yeah. to... Uh, feed their imagination but I'm um, I think they are capable of uh, knowing the difference between oh the yes they are and, yeah well, after mm -hmm. a certain age uh, definitely yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah of course uh, the teachers should caution them about uh, stuff but uh, there's nothing think, wrong but, yeah. with uh, a chair dancing or a flower singing that's mm -hmm. okay even if in normal language uh, uh, well, in normal life, uh, it, they don't do those things, but it's okay. So, uh, and if you're going to use the language, you can be creative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions, my dear colleagues? Uh, Defna Hojam has said, uh, using the visuals, uh, I usually check it beforehand because you never know what you're going to see. Um, uh, in uh, mm -hmm. I lost the, the, the remark, I'm, I'm comment. Ah, Def Nojam says, I would do the research on Google at home before I show yes. them to my students, especially visuals. You never know what may come up. That's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm checking the chat box. Uh, Ojam, if you uh, stop uh, sharing your screen sure. you can also uh, see the chat box and see all the participants mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe if you can I cannot spot any other questions or remarks of course the people thank you for this uh, wonderful talk mm -hmm. Yeah, I thank you again for all the participants. Thank you for your uh, participation. I see uh, all of the comments. 
Thank you for your nice comments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I guess uh, uh, we don't have any questions and um, well, I can keep you here asking all kinds of stupid questions. I love asking stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know that Staff rule no, uh, that that's okay. That's okay. There is, uh, of course, it language is cultural, and there's no English word for that. Uh, you can always pronounce it uh, in, in English. Estrafurler, for example, it, ah, yeah, people that's... people will think that it's English. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> oh. Ifoja, we had great time. It was very informative, very helpful, and especially the tips that you have shared with us. Definitely, I believe my colleagues are going to use those uh, to uh, cre create their own materials, uh, help their students to come up with certain activities. So I cannot thank you enough for this uh, uh, excellent talk. Thank you talk. so much. Uh, this is very valuable coming from you, all of these, uh, you know, very nice comments. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you again for your kind invitation. It was a pleasure for me to present here this evening. And it was a pleasure I would for us to like listen to, to you. Thank, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I would like to thank everybody to, for uh, spending their precious time here with us uh, and I don't know John thank you for your moderation uh, moderating the talk and for the anecdotes and all the positive you know atmosphere you created thank you so much thank you I hope that it was a useful presentation and uh, I congratulate you for all these you know webinars that you are uh, you. organizing and uh, I'm sure that it's uh, benefiting everybody a lot and it will continue to do so. I hope okay. so, yeah. And of course, as usual, I thank all of my colleagues. I cannot count the names here uh, because without them, these webinars are just Jam, you and me talking to each other. So they always make these uh, more meaningful and uh, with their smiling faces, positive energy, I find uh, more strength to go on, more webinars to do. So thank you very much. Take very good care of yourselves. Please, please stay safe. And I hope to see you next week with another guest speaker. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Good evening.